All right, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this, is, uh, this group is BioCaptivate. Uh, we uh, are um, putting ourselves together as a, a nonprofit think tank type entity that uh, will start hosting some salons and gatherings. And we really want people to imagine what science could be. Uh, and we want to know people to know what science is and what it could be. Because so much of our future is based upon, you know, scientific discoveries, uh, engineering of those discoveries for practical uses by society. Uh, if the last century uh, featured the Industrial Revolution and then the Silicon Revolution, probably a biology revolution is going to be uh, what creates uh, so much of what humanity uses and enjoys and eats and, and thrives with uh, uh, in the next uh, 50 or 100 years. So we firmly believe that, but we also think that there hasn't been enough ten attention given to uh, the culture that drives uh, the training and development of scientists and the selective pressures that um, help determine who goes into science and who stays in it. And we want, first of all, everyone to become aware of these selective pressures, uh, and then think about how maybe we can change the narrative and how we can educate and train scientists differently and how scientists can interact with the public differently and, more, and above all, that the public can begin to conceive of itself as a group of scientists because every day, uh, even when we cook things, we're testing hypotheses. And uh, so we are all scientists and we're going to be called upon to make public policy decisions as a group. Uh, it is more important than ever that we all conceive of ourselves as scientists, but then also think about what does it mean to be a professional scientist and what are the selective pressures and how can we change, address and change these narratives. And so today uh, we have a great panel of people whose uh, uh, life and work uh, touches upon science in all its forms, philosophy, education, art, and everyone here is a scientist uh, and or an educator and or an artist and or a philosopher. And we want to have them talk a little bit about the issues that I just mentioned and, and their unique and interesting experiences and perspectives. So uh, I'd like to introduce the panelists and uh, we can go get ahead and get started. Um, so I myself, uh, I'm Louis Metzger. Uh, I formerly worked in um, Big Pharma. I now am the CSO of a startup. I'm a biochemist, a lipid biochemist and a bacteriologist uh, by training uh, and have done other things. Um, but I really support BioCaptivate's mission and um, uh, would, it's my pleasure to help moderate this panel and introduce our guests. So uh, Nick of the Long Now Foundation uh, is uh, a director of, of, a longtime director at the Long Now uh, and um, uh, is a, uh, a systems engineer uh, by training but uh, is also uh, a deep thinker and philosopher uh, by self-guided education and, and through his work uh, which involves interaction with uh, you know sort of the, the most uh, cutting edge thinkers of our times, I, I, I would say. And, uh, and speaking of the culture of science, uh, the Long Now Foundation uh, really cares about thinking uh, and planning for deep time. So what if the world isn't going to end at our own hands in the next 50 or 100 years and we have to think about what 10,000 years of humanity's future looks like? That is a large part of what the Long Now is encouraging us to think about. Uh, Robin uh, is uh, here with us. Uh, she's the uh, um, chief experience officer of uh, the Minerva Project. And the Minerva Project uh, is a four-year uh, undergraduate university now also a, a graduate uh, has a graduate program uh, in data science, I believe. Uh, and um, uh, Minerva is radically different than a lot of uh, four-year uh, educational programs that uh, probably we've all been through. And uh, it's focused on first principle thinking, uh, the training of students first and foremost how to use logic and how to use statistics and how to think uh, and and be very questioning of uh, the data that they receive and how they interpret it. And uh, um, uh, I, uh, because of a great talk that Robin gave uh, maybe three years ago, I became aware of the Minerva Project, and so it's great to have you here. Um, uh, Fatna is, um, uh, how do I see your company's name? 
Ferenim, Ferenim, uh, yeah, Ferenim, not Ferenim. Uh, 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 Fatna is a uh, um, uh, PhD biochemist uh, uh, whose work um, uh, in founding her startup uh, is really interesting because it looks at how uh, um, small organisms, uh, nematodes, uh, communicate with each other and interact with the soil microbiome. And yes, soil does have a microbiome, not just the human gut, and uh, uh, with all sorts of implications for agriculture and how we feed the world uh, uh, with the coming climate change and, and so many other selective pressures. Uh, and uh, talk to her in the happy hour afterward about uh, her company's uh, collaboration with NASA. They are about to do experiments in space. So, uh, June uh, is a uh, investor and uh, a science director uh, here at IndieBio, uh, who we'd like to thank uh, for letting us host this event here. And uh, June uh, has a really uh, uh, interesting career arc. She did her PhD at Scripps. Uh, she's a um, uh, medicinal biochemist by training, chemical, or bio chemical biologist. Well. They, they sort of, there's a high, the, that Venn diagram overlaps. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, June has founded uh, two companies, uh, and she's also uh, sort of the, uh, um, the scientific uh, mover and shaker in this site uh, of, of IndieBio's uh, incubator. And IndieBio uh, incubates uh, startups uh, in health tech and food tech and many other uh, uh, interesting techs uh, that all, in one way or the other, touch upon biology, hence the name. Uh, a little known fact about June is that uh, she also uh, has a clothing line, which I was not aware of. And uh, in the uh, happy hour, uh, you should talk to her about that. And uh, last but not least, uh, Laura Tendesky. Laura uh, has been a protein biochemist uh, at uh, uh, Novartis most recently and presently, uh, but at its predecessor companies um, for dare I ask, 30-ish years. 30 years. Uh, and Laura, um, Laura knows the guy who invented PCR, polymerase chain uh, reaction. And uh, she was involved in uh, the project to first characterize the hep C virus. Um, she's, been, uh, she's on patents uh, and uh, has been involved in the development of uh, multiple successful oncology drugs. And uh, yet the other thing she is, that's half her life. The other half of her life uh, that she does in parallel is she's a mosaicist uh, and an embroiderer and a painter. And her art informs her science, and her science informs her art. And so uh, someone uh, with great perspective. Uh, so uh, let me consult my notes here. Uh, uh, so we have a number of questions that we wanted to, uh, to delve into. But first, I was going to uh, just mention um, and lay out a groundwork for the, f the first question, which is uh, uh, a discussion of austerity in science. So in the history of science, uh, it's been done by different people and different cultures in different ways, historically. Uh, much of, I think, what academic science looks like today still has echoes of the medieval European universities. So where, where you know, the researchers, the doctors of philosophy uh, were actually minor clerics of the church. And uh, it was interesting because they also uh, 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 were judged by the church laws, not by the secular laws. So there was this historic privilege given to universities in the Western tradition. Uh, and um, I think we still see echoes of clerical uh, state in science today. Uh, that's certainly how I felt about my personal life when I was a grad student. But uh, it, it's, it, it's, there, there is this, this, uh, this culture of austerity. But what does it look like? It looks like, in many ways, a discussion of how scientists should just be happy to do science. And they should be slaving away at the lab. And if you think of pop cultural images of like the mad scientist, they're monomaniacal. They're looking at one thing obsessively. But in truth, uh, it's nothing like that. However, the culture of scientific training and the pressures within science to become a professor or to, to go a standard route uh, actually select against people like this group here who've all taken creative different routes um, and selects for people that want to check boxes and follow a certain linear path. And uh, I'd like to start off by discussing you know, where, all, where you all have seen that um, and uh, uh, you know, what, what to you, uh, and I'll start uh, with June maybe, uh, because she's holding the microphone. Uh, what to you is, is, 
is an example of scientific austerity that's like baked into the culture. Yes, absolutely. I would say a lot of it through my entire grad school program and then seeing a lot of that happening um, ongoing is, um, you know, it is in some ways compared to a Ponzi scheme these days that like you have professors that need workers to do all of the tasks and having a person pipette is cheaper than buying a robot that pipettes and the robot still breaks down a lot. So hopefully your person doesn't break down. Um, but in essence, what they do is they, yeah, and you know, you're holding like a PhD in front of, dangling in front of them. And, uh, and they of course, themselves are interested in contributing to science. They got into science for a reason to begin with, right? But um, even in my own PhD, I felt that I was thinking about like less than 5% of the time and just doing very generic grunt work 95% of the time. Taking care of mice is the worst. Mm -hmm. Like I did that for two years and it was awful. Um, and like it's, you know, there's a little bit of like, set up as like a rite of passage like you have to go through this in order to be a scientist and and I really don't think that's true and I think uh, how you actually really become a scientist is to close that iteration cycle right the design test build cycle and the faster you can go through those cycles the faster you can learn and then and then build on top of that so um, but I think the way we currently train scientists is not that. Um, and it's, it's, it's a little bit more structured saying you do X, Y, and Z, and, and this is just what you need to do versus I have an idea, I'm going to test this and go, go try it out. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to try something else out. Um, so it, I think it does hamper innovation definitely within the individual because you're not allowed at times to explore different things, um, either via budget, I, either via time pressure, either, either via your uh, professor telling you what you can and can't do as projects. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think people, once they get out of that environment too, um, they face a lot of challenges thinking that academia and perpetuating this Ponzi scheme is the only way to continue, but only 5% of PhDs end up with academic positions because we don't have that many new universities springing up everywhere. Um, and so we have a glut of talent who are highly trained, highly driven, but with nowhere to go. Um, and that's kind of the heart of Indie Bio too, is we want to adopt all those 95% of the people and say, hey, you can start your lab, you can do your science, do the thing that you were passionate about, but let's try to find a different model. Go for VC funding instead of academia funding. Go for customers and, and producing a product versus just writing a paper. Um, yeah. So, June, you know, one thing that you said that was really interesting and strikes home uh, is spending 95% of the time not thinking but doing things like putting pipette tips in racks and things like that. And uh, which brings to sort of the question of education versus training. And Robin lives this every day. Like, what is education versus training? And I think the Minerva Project uh, spends a lot of time trying to educate. And, and not train. So do you have perspectives on this culture of austerity and how one might overcome it? Yeah, it's so interesting because I listen to June speak and I talk to a lot of students who get admitted to our undergraduate program and they're interested in science and they're really excited about it. And the question they always ask is, well, where are your labs? And then when we talk about what they want to get out of the lab experience, it it isn't that. It isn't sitting and putting, you know, drops into test tubes and things like that. And it's not conducting experiments where it's formulaic. I mean, the beauty of science is it's about discovery. But we teach science so often as here's a formula and here's the reaction you should get. And if you don't get that, you did it wrong. So the question then is how do you teach science in a completely different way? Well, it's actually the way you should educate everyone regardless of discipline. And that is thinking about how do you critically look at the situation that you have? How do you break it down? Or we have some students here in the audience, so they're just going to say, this is what we do. But how do you break it down? What is the right problem? What are you trying to solve for? How do you break it to component parts? How do you test? How do you develop hypotheses, test, challenge, repeat? It's 
it is so much more about the thinking than the actual doing. And when we think about educating, we think about really educating people across all disciplines, meaning how do you think critically? How do you become a creative problem solver? How do you work effectively in teams? Because some of the best science and discoveries don't happen in isolation. How do you communicate well? Because you may have the best idea, but if people don't understand it, then it, it can't go anywhere. So we think about what are the skills you need as a scientist and how do we train for those and where we worry less about you know, the formula for a, a certain experiment. So that's quite refreshing. Thank you. I, I think that that does lead to sort of the application side of things. So um, I'm really curious, Fatma, about your perspective um, because you, you went through sort of the traditional, you know, PhD education. And at some point you said, some, you, you just said, I want to take the risk of, of starting my own company. And with all that entails, which is all manner of difficulty, you know, reputational, financial, so forth. How did the conditions of, of the academic world inform your decision to do that? I should start saying, um, I totally agree with um, <laughs> June, the experience. I was fortunate in some ways. I had a really great PhD experience. My PhD advisor really cared about his students, and I actually got the learning. I didn't actually have to do the pipetting. Mm -hmm. He didn't really have too much resources. Uh, but I actually did experiment, and I had really great uh, mentors. I learned how to do science. I really liked it, and I really enjoyed it. And I thought, oh, I should definitely do a postdoc and move into a different field, from molecular biology to chemistry. Now, that was good and bad decision, because different disciplines have different culture. And particularly in medical school. I'm not bad-mouthing, but <laughs> It's, it was a new learning. There, I actually experienced a Ponzi scheme because I think there were so many students, so many actually motivated students, I think more than they wanted. And College of Ag, they didn't really have that many students, so whatever they had, they cherished them. <laughs> when you have abundance of it. Then one day I realized, like June said, the Ponzi scheme, and there wasn't any future, and I thought, I want to do this thing, and I know it has a potential, what I discovered, how can I do it? And I thought, we are very resourceful, that is one of the things you learn when you are a PhD, because you don't really have resources, and I was very fortunate to be introduced in Dubai. And right at the same time, we got SBIR phase one funding, thanks to my PhD advisor who taught me how to get funding and it taught me how to write grants and how to organize. Then I started my company. One thing I should mention, um, what Robin said, I had undergraduate students, I had this training grant. And I actually trained my students, and one of them got into a medical school. She said, hey, Dr. Kaplan, I got into the school because of your teaching. During the interview, everything I learned in your lab, all of the experience I had in your lab, I told them that was the only thing. And she comes back, she says she got in. And she's in Lewis Cott's, um, now I can't really, uh, Temple Medical School. And she was very worried initially. And I thought, you're very smart. Just be yourself. And that was the science experience. In many ways, Moving into um, industry was the best thing I have ever done. I wish I had done it as soon as I graduated. <laughs> the, uh, that's a really very interesting perspective. And uh, I may have agree with you on the industry thing myself. Now, that isn't to say that academia is bad. It's just, uh, it's not for everyone. And one, uh, one thing, you know, circling back to this idea of, of overcoming austerity in science, and especially fluctuating austerity. Um, Laura has worked in, in the biotech industry for longer than most of us, I think, and has seen it all, um, the triumphs and, and, and the layoffs and the rehirings. And, and I was going to ask, what has your perspective been 
uh, regarding cultures where you've worked, because the culture has varied all the time at Novartis and its predecessor companies over the years. What were successful scientific cultures and what were less successful ones? Really good question. It's interesting because when I started working, I basically have worked in the same place ever since I was uh, in school. I got the job and I always thought I would quit if I would look for another job if I didn't like it. And I have never looked for another job. And it's because it's never been boring. It changes basically every two years. The technology changes, everything changes. Culture changes, projects change. I've worked on infectious disease, I've worked on oncology. And that's the nice thing about being a protein chemist. Everybody needs protein chemistry. Um, and as far as culture goes, um, by far the best projects that I've worked on have been people who, groups where um, basically everybody's a leader. Um, you could be a, a grad student that's in there or a postdoc in a, in a meeting and you get listened to just as, as readily as uh, anybody else. Um, it's, it's a, the groups that are collaborative are the best. Um, I've, I've been on really bad project groups where you get uh, basically one leader who says my way or the highway and, uh, and that's just not creative. Um, one thing I've realized is, and, and I encourage people to do, students, um, and something that I did, I actually don't have a PhD. I have a, a bachelor's in biochemistry and uh, at one point, I'm like, okay, should I quit and go get a PhD? And I looked around at the jobs that PhD people did and the jobs that quote unquote technicians do. And my personality fits so much better with the technician. And uh, I like, if you look at my art, it's all very repetitive, it's mosaic, it's, it's uh, and so I paid attention to what makes me happy instead of put, trying to put myself in a hole, when you know, in a round hole, but I'm actually square type of, you know. So I, I really um, tried to find what made me happy. But as far as cultures go, um, yeah, I have seen a lot of things. My favorite culture um, are these just wonderful collaborations. I've been in some pretty bad cultures where one person came, a leader of the company came in, he, he was there for about five years, and he would pit scientists against each other and, and they wouldn't know it. It was horrible. So they would give the same project to one group and, and, and another group. And they would find out because they were both working with our group and there'd be tears and it was, it was just absolutely horrible. And that's not good industry, that's not good scientists. I think collaboration and working together, you're going to be able to, this competition is ridiculous. It makes me angry. But, <laughs> but yeah, I've seen all kinds of different styles in the last 30 years in the same company. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I was going to, you know, Nick in his role interacts with the whole uh, arc of, of science and engineering and design types from the lone genius uh, to the people whose, whose uh, work is best understood as a group effort with, with equal contribution. And I would just ask broadly, what's, what have you observed culturally in the scientists that you've collaborated with, that Long Now has collaborated with, and where would you like to see changes or improvements in general? That's a tough question because I don't know the full backgrounds of all the different individuals and groups that we work with, but I think the thing that draws a lot of people to the Long Now Foundation and the ideas that we're kind of cultivating is this sense that austerity uh, doesn't grant you permission to explore the things that you want to explore, um, makes you feel constrained, um, it's not exactly fun, it's not exactly the best educative experience, and that in some sense everyone that's kind of constellating around the foundation believes that having more time 
is good for a certain set of problems. And so there are problems in which austerity works, optimization works, you want to get them done fast, get them out of the way. But then there's a whole other set of problems out there in the world that benefit from having additional resources, temporal, financial, whatever it is. Um, and so adapting yourself optimally to one set of challenges leaves you vulnerable at this other level of abstraction, these other kinds of challenges. And so culturally, in the broader sense, you know, we're very well adapted to things like the business quarter. Um, and we're very poor adapted to challenges that just don't exist on that time scale. So things like climate change or space exploration. These, these phenomena exist at another level of abstraction that we just haven't really adapted ourselves well to. And so kind of how do you diversify temporal preferences across, you know, all of these different time spans. For us, it's you know as much as 10,000 years out in the future, um, because it changes the way you think about things. You know, if I said, you know, for your business challenges, or you know, take world hunger for example. If somebody said, can you solve world hunger in five years? You, it would make a lot of sense to be completely paralyzed by that challenge and not necessarily know what to do. Or you think about the SDGs and even the time scales that they're on. This is this can be paralyzing for a lot of people. Whereas if I said, you know, could you solve world hunger in 500 years? Well, you, your brain starts to operate, starts to whir away, and you start to think of maybe the first couple of meetings that you're going to have, kind of what direction you're going to take your year on. Um, and so you start feeling a sense of agency restored, as opposed to feeling like you can't be an agent, like you can't be in control, you don't have permission to try things, explore. Um, and so we're trying to kind of push back against a certain kind of temporal austerity uh, in the culture on a whole. Thanks. That's, that's really an interesting way of looking at it. Resources, time is the resource that you really cannot buy. And I think we often undervalue it. Uh, and to our uh, individual and collective peril. Uh, and so I, yeah, that's a, thank you very much for bringing that uh, perspective to the table. Now, we're, we're talking about the culture of science and, and um, Reimagining how you know, well, looking at what it looks like now and what it what it could look like, and I think that, that can't be discussed um, without looking at stereotypes and thinking about how scientists portray themselves. I must say, and also how they're portrayed, uh, sometimes fairly, sometimes unfairly, in pop culture. Uh, you know, the cartoon strip scientist who has all these colored beakers. Uh, by the way, most things in lab are clear. Uh, mm -hmm. I, my parents once asked me what I did for a living, and I sarcastically told them I transfer small volumes of clear liquid into other small volumes of clear liquid, <laughs> and uh, something invisible is happening that I indirectly detect. And they haven't really asked me since then, you know. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but 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 really, like you know, there's 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 an important aspect, I think, in encouraging people to go into science who are more cognitively diverse than the person that finishes undergrad and says to themselves, "I want to be a tenure track professor at a top ten research school, and I want to get there in you know 15 years, and that's what I want to do with my life." You know, a certain per type of person does say that, but are those always the people that bring? interesting discoveries to the table, especially people who might look at things differently than those very linearly minded individuals that know they want that. Um, and, and so uh, I'm going to ask the panel uh, about how one might reimagine the culture of science. And, and maybe first, though, ask what do you think is wrong or less ideal about the portrayal of scientists? And, and how does that interact with what you know about yourself or you know, your circle of, of collaborators and friends in the field? Uh, and uh, just discuss that. And uh, I think I might um, start with June, uh, just to sort of evenly spread uh, the questions. Um. So I actually think that scientists is actually really diverse because um, especially in the US, we have a lot of international students. So like, and, and also in biology, we're actually really fortunate to have almost a 50-50 split in women, which is really awesome. Um, I uh, actually would flip it on its head that we actually um, are so diverse that at times um, we can't even find each other because we just we look normal like all of you presumably a lot of you are scientists you look perfectly normal whereas like in te the tech Silicon Valley sphere you know you, you, there's like the tech bro stereotype and so and and that's you know cool for them because they get to like find their people. Um, in some ways I feel like scientists were like really spread out and we're like actually in you know different pockets and doing our own thing. Um, uh, th that was one of the ideas around my clothing brand actually, which I, I don't know why I'm not wearing today, um, is, uh, is to try to especially get women to wear little things to show that they're scientists to, to just appear 
in public more um, so that you that the general public who are not scientists don't see scientists as like the Einstein looking crazy hair old man in some lab doing crazy stuff um, you know maniacally tweaking the world or something um, but that to really get out there to say that hey scientists are around you all the time we're very diverse from all kinds of cultures we, there's so many women um, in science as well and to kind of bring that conversation Can I just just a quick thing. Um, one thing I've noticed in the friends that I've made and also looking at myself, pretty much every creative scientist that I work with is, uh, is also some sort of artist, some kind of sort of creative person. Um, sometimes people are per portrayed like, like Lewis says, but most of us are either a musician or an artist or, a, or you know, a, and basically, you have to be creative to be a good scientist. And I think people don't really realize that. Uh, and I'd like to, to honor that a little bit more and, and maybe get that message out there, too. So I was going to ask maybe Robin. Sorry, I didn't use my microphone. Uh, okay. uh, I was going to ask Robin, uh, you see so many students, and you help to design curricula that tie together the sciences with with philosophy and art and, and so, much, uh, so much subject matter that brings something to the table in terms of providing context and, in fact, inspiration for the science. And what do you see the role of, of image and culture in science uh, as affecting that work? Yeah, it, it's so interesting, and I so appreciate the comments of the other panelists who are maybe more traditionally scientists. I'm probably one in the looser definition, but I think about it all the time because science in isolation is essentially a function, but it's not going to solve some of the greater challenges. And so when we think about curriculum, when I think about educating students, I think about much more interdisciplinary approach to any kind of challenges and science being that. So, you know, when we look at how we design curriculum, we make sure that students aren't looking at a problem in isolation. So we actually did something kind of unique. I'll give you a very specific sort of approach we have to our first year curriculum is instead of saying you're going to learn chemistry biology, economics, take a writing class. What we say is we're going to talk about problems like how to feed the world. We're going to talk about what do we do about the world's water supply. We're going to ask why do people commit crimes. We're going to talk about how do you stop war. We're going to talk about really, really complex challenges because if you think about each of these, there's a science angle, there's a social science angle to it, there's an interpersonal connection to it. Everything in life is a complex system and there are second order and third order effects. And how you think about that in a really broad context is going to make people better scientists. So it really is, how do we get out of that stereotype of a scientist is in their lab by themselves? They're actually out thinking about how to apply science in a really practical way. And, and along those lines, uh, I was going to ask you, Nick, um, about uh, in your line of work, you oversee uh, collaborations of all different sizes, and 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 how how does culture play a role in the you know the cultures of the participants, um, scientifically and intellectually and otherwise, play a role in in those collaborations? I think back to the earlier comment that we were discussing yeah. about these other cultures being um, mostly rooted in the idea of taking the right amount of time for things. That things like creativity, original thinking, divergent thinking, they take a bit of an, uh, an abundance of resources that our culture doesn't necessarily um, support people using all the time. We don't always want to give people 500 years to solve world hunger. And sometimes we expect people to launch and sell a company and then launch and sell another one immediately afterwards. Um, so the, this culture of uh, passing the baton as opposed to necessarily, you know, just kind of dunking the basketball. This idea that, you know, our culture is very good at lifting people up when they are, uh, they are basically starting an idea, taking it to fruition, and then closing the whole thing up, and then saying that was great, that's packaged, put that in the past, let's try something new and do that again. Um, we're trying to see this idea that it can be all right to uh, start projects without feeling obliged to necessarily finish them within your lifetime, that there are certain, again, certain projects at certain time scales that just won't be finished within one lifetime or one, you know, a couple of business quarters. So how do we make it cool to be the kind of person or the kind of, uh, you know, um, 
member of an institution that's just passing the baton from one stage to the next, whether that's the first stage, the last stage, the middle stages. How do we get? How do we see that as something that people aspire to? Um, more of like the maintenance side of the world that we live in as opposed to just this innovative like flash of genius archetype of just like, oh, I had a great new way of doing this. It's like, well, no, no, I'm actually helping them do this awesome thing that they've been doing for a while. So uh, I think that uh, Fatma, um, in her role as, as founding a company and putting together a team, uh, I th did you, in doing this, have to overcome this like individual in a lab doing great science <laughs> to shifting that frame uh, as a reference, as Nick points out, to a, this is a team-based product. This isn't a, the, the lone genius archetypical science model. And could you speak to that, like what worked and what didn't? And yes, that is actually one of our strengths. We work as one, as a team. And that is one of the emphasis, actually. Anybody came to our lab, we emphasize that. If somebody falls through the crack, we all fall. So uh, one of the reason I do once a week lab meetings, we actually talk a lot more, but once a week I'll make sure that everyone is same level, no one is falling through cracks, and if someone is behind, and we'll talk and help them out to be the same level. So that, that I do care, and everyone, one other thing I taught everyone is time management. Yeah. I don't manage anyone's time. Everyone manages their own time. But I was the expert initially how the experiments were done, and I taught them. And I did that actually even before I started my company. I was when I was doing masters, and I had a group of undergraduates. The first two months, I taught them how to manage their time and how to do this experiment. Then they recruited their own friends, and next thing I know, they're teaching each other. And they were working so well. Then I moved on to another project, and I asked them for help, and I said, well, here is one of the things I need help. They said, when can you do it? They said, well, here is our schedule. We can give it to you two weeks later. And I said, good. Now I knew two weeks later I was going to have what I needed. And same thing with my lab, and when they needed to have time, they said, well, here's the experiment. This is the time it's going to be ending. We would like to have a break. And I said, sure. So what are the things you need help while you're on vacation so ex your experiment would be going? And they said, well, we don't really need any help. We finish it on this day. We come back. When we come back, our experiment is going to be ready. And I said, yes, I can't really ask anything more. Then we can do more creative stuff. So we work as a whole. If somebody needs, you know, there are sometimes maintenance, a couple of things here and there. They said, well, I talked to this person and who's going to be helping me out when I'm gone and when I come back, I can pick up where I left. Thank you. Uh, I can put in a, a bit of perspective uh, from my own experience. So, uh, you know, in my graduate work and my postdoc, I worked in friendly collaborative labs, but labs where each, each trainee had their own project and there were sort of boxes drawn around those. So, you know, sometimes the project was lucky. If it was novel biology, sometimes you'd get lucky. Sometimes it would turn out to be much harder than it, it, it appeared at first glance. Uh, and this was good for, for enforcing self-reliance, but it was not an efficient way to discover new things. And, and, and maybe its purpose wasn't. Uh, but that model is the very large sort of big research academia driven uh, vehicle for doing basic research in much of the world, uh, including the US. And what was really refreshing about, uh, and you may laugh at me about this, but what was really refreshing about joining Big Pharma is that uh, everything was a team-based effort. And for the most part, teams were rewarded together and also called to accountability together. And this, to me, was very refreshing. And it actually it had an interesting effect on making the internal research more reproducible. Because if you were a, a single contributor and your output are scientific papers, and the higher impact journal scientific papers, the better, you might oversell the value of what you discovered, or maybe omit some key control experiments. Uh, and this can make it much more difficult for people to build on what you've published. But inside a company where other people are depending upon the work that you're doing right next to them to help build an edifice that needs to work 
in its entirety, uh, there's an opposite selective pressure. If anything, uh, people under underplayed their results because they wanted to be absolutely sure that those were reproducible. So I know that big pharma is not always held up as uh, a, a place where you know everyone thinks great science is done, but really great science is done there often. And one of those reasons is because of this team environment. But the other perspective, moving from the like individual contributor to uh, um, science as a team uh, uh, affair is uh, what I found working for a small startup is there's only two of us in a company now that's like 13 or 14 people that had industry experience. And so it's been a, a fun and interesting cultural uh, uh, effort to change the culture of the company and say, okay, you know, we need to actually coordinate our schedules and, and manage time and and view our successes and failures as a team effort. And I, I, I really think I think that that's key. And, and I'll also mention that uh, maybe the subject of a future uh, panel or event uh, we're going to do is think about instances where credit for science uh, is not divided the way it maybe ought to be. Uh, Rosalind Franklin, uh, an X-ray crystallographer and one of the co-discoverers of the DNA uh, structure, uh, is a prime example of maybe someone who didn't get credit for many reasons. Notably, the Nobel Prize can't be split more than three ways. But if you look at the research underlying any given Nobel Prize, there's probably 20 or 50 or 100 or more people uh, who've contributed to that. So, um, you know, something to think about. Um, so I've a few. I've only two more questions, and then we'll we'll uh, uh, mingle and and uh, uh, do some um, uh, somewhat directed small talk. Uh, and Yen, uh, who's organized this event, will will explain that. Uh, but uh, each of you is a really complex individual, as we all are, and. In, in looking at a group of science scientists and science enabling and oriented people, I wanted to ask this question, which is, if you're, if you're an iceberg, there's a tip of you sticking out of the ocean, and then there's the larger volume that's underneath. And, you know, in this, these times you might be mostly molten, but uh, I'd like, you know, maybe each of you to say, what's the tip of your iceberg that people see you? And if they were to draw a, a caricature, what would they seize upon? And then what's the part of you that's, that's, that's deep and large volume uh, under the surface? So. Let's start from oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let whoever wants to. Let's see, the tip of the iceberg. That's interesting. I've changed so much in the last three years. I'm, I'm a lot different than the way I used to be. I used to be terribly shy. And now, basically, I wear sparkly things, clothes, art that, that I have made and I'm a lot more visible. So I would say the the most visible is the artist in me. Um, down deep is probably more the science actually. So, and Nick, I just wanted to, when you were talking about making it cool to be, um, to work on things that might take longer than a lifetime, I thought about Sagrada Familia. Are you familiar with that? Gorgeous, gorgeous, and Gaudi started it, and it was finished, I think, 125 years later. And it's, it's just a beautiful example of that kind of um, cooperation. Still being worked on. I know. Still? I, was yes. I thought it was finished. It's still got scaffolding. Still under construction. Oh, I need to go back. It's gorgeous. Highly recommend. It's, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Even is, before being completed. It is so beautiful. Barcelona. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that, that's a really, I think this idea of projects that are greater than an individual person that you contribute to, do your best, but you might not see the end of. Yep. Um, when I worked in pharma, that's kind of my approach to all the projects I was on. Yeah, me too. And, and indeed, the division uh, whose work I mostly supported, infectious diseases, was shut down um, for business reasons. Uh, but um, you know, we're releasing the data to the public and the work will go on. So this idea, there is an element of scientific culture that is, is looking at these long timelines and saying, can I be, if I, if I don't worry about my own ego, can I be part of something that's impactful and long-term and a meta structure that many people have contributed to? So that's a really cool point, Laura. Who else, what's, who else has an iceberg tip? 
All right, I'll go. Um, I think if you look at the tip of the iceberg where most people have seen me the last seven years or so, it's out talking about education, innovation in education, and I'm very often out and about around the world, um, and that's what people see. But I think what is below the surface is I am a mom. I care a lot about my family, my kids, and that kind of grounds me. And the piece that a lot of people don't know is I am really a wanderer. So whereas I'm very, very directed in what I do, and people always say, you know, type A, goal-driven, but my background in the past had a lot of travel in it. And I really believe that life is not about just knowing where you want to get to, but it's actually taking the journey and taking a lot of side tracks and side paths and getting off the road that everybody else is on and trying different things. And if you look at my career, it isn't as direct as anybody would think. There's sort of every piece, there's lots of layers Thank you. There's lots of layers to everything, and I think that's the piece that's below the surface that no one sees. So it seems like my turn. <laughs> well, on the surface, everybody knows here I have a startup and I, I'm an entrepreneur and scientist, so that would be the visible part. I think the invisible part, I'm a human. And I love my family and I like to spend time with them and I like the community and I believe the strong community creates a strong relationships and I care about people and I like to bond with people and I like socializing. I'm a social person. <laughs> so I think I'm like everybody else and we all care about each other and making friends. That would be the bigger than me part. <laughs> Um, I think on the surface when people find out that I work for the Long Now Foundation and they have some familiarity with some of our projects that are kind of moonshot projects on large time scales for building a clock inside of a mountain that'll last for 10,000 years with no human intervention and working to de-extinct the woolly mammoth with genomic technology and landing a language archive on a comet. These are like really fun things to say here on a dais because they sound really cool and really amazing. Um, and there's some really cool people involved in it. And so I think on the surface, a lot of times people think that's probably the coolest part of the job or something that I'm really paying attention to. But the truth is like, I get so much more pleasure in having conversations with people who are inspired to work on really interesting things that just haven't taken off yet. Uh, you don't know their name yet. I don't know their name. You know, I'm meeting them in the context of you know an event or you know a cocktail party or an event like this. Um, and I think that's just fascinating to find what people are dedicating their lives to are leaving academia because they just feel so strongly that this project needs to be worked on. And if it needs to be in the private space, let's take it to the private space. Or if we need to reinvent education models, like let's just do it. It's so important. We have to do it. So so I'm constantly inspired by the people that are around me working on these really interesting things. Um, yeah, and that just like gives me a lot of hope for the future. Um, and yeah, that wouldn't necessarily be on the surface. People probably are like, oh yeah, how many times have you been to the clock this week? <laughs> Zero. Thanks, Nick. Right. June's the next. June didn't go yet. Okay. Finally, think about this. Um, so on the tip of the iceberg, um, you know, scientific director here at Indie Bio, helping companies helping scientists become entrepreneurs and realizing their dream and build innovation in the world. Um, some of the personal reasons for that underneath, uh, one is that because I was a scientist who became an entrepreneur and so I want to bring, get more scientists to bring their science into the world. Um, secondly, that, um, you know, as a nerd girl growing up, I was picked on as being like, really into science and but now I'm like out there saying like oh, science is really cool so like trying to bring that joy of science into the world um, and uh, and to get people to pay attention to it because as we know science literacy is not so great in America and that has led to a lot of political issues um, and I want more people to embrace science to, to think about it as you know a you know, valid, obviously, in the world, and uh, and to think more logically and, and come to some of their own conclusions themselves. Um, and then on the other side of just like seeing entrepreneurship and help helping see entrepreneurship, I'm just so fascinated by human ingenuity. Like everything you see in this room was created by people. Um, we you know started as cavemen, and now we have everything, and we're you know curing diseases and and hacking our own 
genetics, right? We are changing, using our technology to change the evolutionary processes in which we, our genetics, are now selected for, and, uh, and that has a lot of responsibility that could go very well or go very badly, um, but we are shepherding that and we're building technologies for that. Um, and then on the very last, personal level, you know, I want to be healthy and potentially live a long time. And so um, trying to expand health span and longevity. Uh, and then that also goes into climate change because if, you know, climate change doesn't revert in the next couple of, you know, de decades, uh, we're not going to have a great home on this planet either. So all these things are pressing issues um, that we are going to be facing. And uh, I'll, I'll put in on the surface, um, I'm really interested, and people know my interest, in uh, finding new chemical matter encoded by the genome of nature. And how do we, how do, we do this more efficiently? How do we hunt uh, amid the metagenome uh, to find new enzymes that do new chemistry that's useful, uh, uh, sometimes medicinally, sometimes for... for um, uh, uh, material science purposes, and and uh, uh, this CSO of Bolt Thread uh, is joining us tonight. And uh, what Bolt Thread has done uh, is exactly that. They prospected in metagenomic space, found a really useful type of protein, and how to manipulate it, and how to engineer it. And they're making an entirely new material that that humanity did not have access to before. Um, so my you know day job and a lot of my extra time is spent thinking about these things. But what most people don't know about me is, uh, for fun, uh, outside of science, uh, I read quite a bit of fairly obscure history. Well, I started with the less obscure, but I, I'm a student of history and and with a particular interest in how people's how societies collective worldviews about certain subjects shifts over time. And, and sometimes it shifts really quickly, and sometimes it's really slow. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, it, it, there's heterogeneity in it, and yet at the same time, there's themes uh, in, in understanding human nature and how, how groups of humans make decisions that I think we learn from history. But now we're at this interesting point where I don't think people have fundamentally changed, yet the technology at our disposal has changed quite a bit. Some would say it's still changing exponentially. Uh, and, you know, how do we, I spend a lot of time because of that thinking about how do we traverse this exciting but dangerous period where we can bend biology and science to the service of humanity, we can bend it to the service of, of maybe reversing some of the damage we've done to the earth. Um, but doing so will take away some people's jobs. If we do it well, it'll take everyone's away everyone's need to work to subsist, but how do we transition through that middle period where some people are employed, some people aren't, uh, and robotics have taken their jobs, or bioengineering has taken their jobs. So, so I think that, that that's, I, that's the thing that people don't know about me, is I spend a lot of time thinking about history, what we learn about people from things that have happened in history, and how we can use those learnings uh, as we go forward. Um, and. Uh, uh, question. Yeah. So, so first, I wanted to thank. Uh, we'll we'll do the questions. I wanted to thank all the panelists who've you know come out on a weekday night and and uh, uh, you know done us the honor of their pres presence and their perspective most of all. And I hope you all see from this panel that their science scientific culture has heterogeneity and 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 diversity and there's many determinants of of culture and the lives of scientists that are important to consider um, I'd also like to thank um, Yan Lu, who's in the back. Uh, he's the uh, uh, program director uh, and essentially founder of uh, BioCaptivate. And uh, we're doing this as an experiment. You all are uh, a select set of invited guests who are part of our experiment. Uh, but, but Yan put this together, and we're really curious what, what you all think about it. Um, and I'd like to thank IndieBio for hosting. I'd like to thank the other BioCaptivate uh, uh, co-conspirators uh, who can't be with us tonight but helped, uh, Kira Havens, uh, Chris Oakes, uh, and Ian Hayden. Uh, and uh, so uh, we, you know, we're going to, this is going to evolve um, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, uh, some upcoming things that we don't have the schedules nailed down is uh, 
we want we want to look at some narratives in science, some specific narratives, and do maybe some deeper dives, for instance, into uh, the life of Rosalind Franklin, uh, the co-discoverer of DNA structure, and uh, maybe also do some some discussions of specific tech meets society societal problems, like you know. What did we really learn from the Human Genome Project, and how has that affected general you know, culture? So stay tuned. Those sorts of things are coming. And sometimes we'll have panels. Sometimes we'll have salons. Sometimes we'll have happy hours. Sometimes we'll have lectures. Um, I gave a talk uh, to us that I, we can make available online uh, uh, in the past about why DNA is not computer coding um, or computer codes, so uh, things like that. So we want to stimulate you and, and, and actually have you help us come up with what is a playbook for communicating science uh, in these times. Um, so without further ado, we have interesting panelists. We have someone who's waiting to ask a question. Mario, uh, uh, let's get started. Questions? Um, so something I was just thinking about listening to you guys speak, um, you know, it's, we want to get more people involved in science and, you know, like how do we get more women involved in science? How do we get, uh, you know, disenfranchised people involved in science? How do we get people from different backgrounds involved? Um, how do we, you know, address the two different kinds of genius? Now we, you know, really have the flash genius in mind, but there's the slow genius and that's kind of what the Long uh, Now Foundation kind of caters to. And I'm wondering if you guys think, or in, in artistry too, so I'm wondering, you know, how do you guys think about it in the lens of inclusivity? Because when I think about it, it's like all of these things can be viewed through the lens of just opening up opportunities to more people to get involved and kind of shine in the lens of science. So, um, you know, it's not a word that's come up yet, So, but I'm wondering if that's something that you guys think about in terms of, you know, your mission. Well, I can speak for BioCaptivate and see, say yes. Um, and uh, we really want to encourage people to think about science, even if their day job is something else, um, because we're all scientists. and. Uh, and we have to make policy decisions. Uh, at the very least, people should uh, understand some science, but it's also fun to participate in. And I know what you're doing with Counterculture Labs, uh, Mario, is right in the midst of encouraging people who might not otherwise be involved with science to become citizen scientists. And um, so BioCaptivate you know, definitely encourages that. Uh, I'd say I'd like to ask the panelists if anyone has some perspectives on on, on Mario's uh, uh, question and comment. I say join a startup because pretty much every bio startup is going to have multiple functions, right? You need operations, you need biz, business people, you might need marketing. And now it's also we're seeing that biotech is now a technology just like the tech sector. It's booming in all areas of of different sectors. So, you know, there's transportation companies, there's food companies, there's neurotech, there's all kinds of different things. So, um, I think that's a great way for someone who might not be traditionally embedded in science to get in and learn science. And once they're there, you know, they're going to take that experience and go elsewhere with that. So, in our case, science is not very easy to communicate. But we finally got a project. We are very excited about it. It's Astro Nematode. Uh, some of you might have the uh, <laughs> mission patch. When I used to say nematodes, people used to say, oh, yeah, interesting. And then next thing you know, the attention disappeared. But this one, we say, hey, you're sending nematodes to space. And they say, tell me more about it. Why are you sending them to space? So it is a great project. And we made its own website. And we are trying to include as much uh, as many people as we can. And we already got invited to give a talk for, actually, it is for the San Francisco High School. And I thought, this is a really great project. One of the reasons is, when you're a kid, you always think about something. When I was a kid, well, I was going to go to Disneyland. <laughs> I never even thought about sending nematodes to space. Do you an experiment in space? Can I actually dream about it? Can I actually imagine? If you imagine and dream, you can do it. But how could you do something you couldn't even imagine? Well, even if you did imagine, it's so far away. Can you actually reach to it? So we thought with this project, we can actually include everyone. It's a project we share with everyone. So the project has its own website, its Twitter, so we will be updating everyone. If you want to be part of it, we have Indiegogo campaign too. We'll put your name there <laughs> as part of the mission partners. So we are very excited because it's the first science project, science project I can share with everyone. <laughs> That's awesome. 
I don't, know, I don't know if there's more questions. I mean, I'll, I'll answer really quick. Um, and I'll just say that part of it is just exposure. I mean, that's the question, like, how do you get people more excited about science? It's about giving people an opportunity in a safe space. And I think about most universities, and if you go into some of the intro science classes, they're all considered like the filter classes, right? This is for the students who want to go to med school. And typically, people hate those classes. They're just grind. And you know, how do you reimagine? I mean, it's something we did. How do you reimagine the sciences and have every single student get exposed to it? It doesn't mean they're all going to major in it. It doesn't mean they're all going to become scientists. But they certainly understand it. They understand what experiments are about. They understand how to think about data sets. They think about logic in terms of planning out how you're going to approach a challenge. So I think it, it's incumbent upon us to require it, and I think it starts early. We happen to do it at the college level. Start earlier. Get students excited about science early and make it approachable. Absolutely. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, start collaborating with a lot of people on the art level. My friend Greg Bilkey back there is we're going to be collaborating, um, basically using art to introduce science. Um, I was talking to a friend, uh, he's a grad student, and he says that when people find out, oh, you're a biochemist, it's like an intimidating word, like, oh, you're, you're some crazy person that I can't talk to because you speak a different language. And in some ways that's true, but in a lot of ways that's not. It took me five minutes to explain the concept of PCR to Greg, and he's a smart guy, and he completely understands it and sees the, sees the artistry of it and, the, and the, just the beauty of it. And bringing, bringing science to everyone through art, um, I, I'm really, really, really excited about it. And it's, it's, it's just a different way of communicating it. So. And I'll echo what Robin said about exposure. We think that's so important. And uh, at the Long Now Foundation, we have a speaking series here in San Francisco. We actually have two speaking series, one of them at SF Jazz, one of them at our spot, The Interval, which is up on the North Waterfront. But we take both of them, we record them, and we send them out as podcasts. We're going to be releasing a bunch of this talk, these talks as YouTube videos for everybody to access. They're currently up on our website. And uh, we get about a million people tuning into those every single year. And I get some really interesting emails from people all over the country and all over the world who are uh, are not scientists. They have jobs as truck drivers or school teachers or any other job you can imagine. And they'll send things in and talk about, oh my God, I'm, you, this talk blew my mind and now I've been down a rabbit hole. And you know, with the internet to kind of augment people's exposure to these ideas, people can really kind of ramp up their own education and things. And I think we had talked a little bit about how uh, so many of the interesting things you find that inform your science are other things like art or other fields of study like history that kind of start to inform the way you're thinking about it. And so... Yeah. So, I, I, so you have a question? Uh, I do. Um, well, I have a comment first, which is thank you everyone for coming out here. This is excellent. I really appreciate this salon, people thinking about things and, I don't know, taking their precious time on a weeknight to do this. <laughs> now, um, I'm asking a question kind of on behalf of my younger self. Looking at the system, um, it seems like most people that you talk to, they'd be appalled to know how small the NSF budget is. It's like a fraction of a percent and it's ridiculous. Um, if you were to really, and again, I say I asked this on the behalf of my younger self because I remember being kind of like naive and not understanding how long things take and asking, you know, what would we really expect to come out of the system? If most of the money comes from creating, you know, clever financial products, that's where people are going to go. Um, it seems pretty ridiculous to expect that anything different is going to happen. So, Nick, I really like what you said about having a different perspective. And I'm wondering if, uh, as kind of a challenge to you guys as leaders in the space, what would you recommend to all of the highly motivated and talented people out here? What would you actually do to change the second and third order terms in this function? If you really wanted this to change, if you wanted to put more money into science, you wanted to tell people that, um, academia is not just a Ponzi scheme, that it is very creative and you could do things. How, what sorts of instructions would you give to people to go into this and not make the rational decision, which is, you know, yeah, you know, go into like management and take credit for other people's work or, I don't know, invest in things that are probably going to make money or start a startup and then sell it to Novartis. No, no offense, I think Novartis is a great company, but realistically, I'm wondering, like, as a challenge to you guys, 
what would you tell people to make real changes to like the second and third order terms in this function? How do you make sure that we don't continue doing this thing at a really slow pace and you know, see what we've been seeing for the last 100 years or so? Um, I think that people should really pursue what they're passionate about. And, um, and I think society has, and especially you know, parents and culture, have really told us to like, go to school to get that good job. School is the means to that end. Um, and same with your PhD. It's like, well, it doesn't exactly matter what I work on because I just want a PhD. Or like, oh, now I'm going to go into a postdoc doing something a little bit different versus just having more of a clear idea saying, like, I want to solve this problem. I want to end cancer. I want to you know, figure out how Alzheimer's works. And, and then going and finding how to get there. So it's... Um, yeah, it's definitely a balance, and I think it's economically driven because we all have to eat, and so uh, sometimes an economic option and that safety net um, is more attractive than going after and taking those risks. Um, but if you can find ways to creatively get to what you're actually passionate about uh, as fast as possible by taking as little risk as possible, uh, then definitely try that path. So I would I would echo June especially on on the temporal advice like you know try to succeed or fail at something or determine you like something or don't like it quickly um, and then get on with your life and 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 continue doing these experiments um, in, in terms of, of of how we change for instance how scientists are compensated or or how science is incentivized that's more complicated um, merely increasing the budget. Um, for science education probably won't help. Actually, uh, the NIH budget uh, around the turn of the millennium uh, infamously doubled. And a lot of that doubling went into you know, more grant money, uh, which encouraged more junior faculty to positions to be created, but those junior faculty needed uh, the pyramid of grad students and postdocs to assemble under them to produce data, which produced papers, which gets more grant money. So pretty soon the money was insufficient and there were just, you know, twice as many people running in that particular, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, experiment. Um, but so, so just just increasing the funding it maybe isn't enough. Uh, restructuring it though uh, could help. And there's been a lot of discussion of this among people who talk about the postocalypse, uh, the postdoc apocalypse. Uh, there's somewhere on the order of 80 or 100,000 people with PhDs circulating around from, from postdoc appointment to postdoc appointment, or just leaving the workforce uh, because you know they they don't they don't see a way out or they don't have a way out uh, into a, a job that they feel fits their education or a career that fits their education. Um, so maybe incentivizing universities not to harvest grant money and perpetuate the pyramid scheme in the way that they do, but instead say, let's have smaller laboratories where a professor has a high paid, maybe one highly paid postdoc, uh, uh, maybe one research assistant professor or, or senior technician associated with them, and and just change the structure from of our science from mega labs to mom and pop you know, uh, labs. Uh, the, the Canadian research system uh, largely looks like that with some exceptions. Um, uh, to give you uh, sort of a personal idea, you know, to give you an idea of, of how austere things can be, um, when I was a postdoc at UCSF, the standard salary was 42K a year. Uh, try living on that. And I was like, oh man, what have I done wrong in life? I'm like almost 30 and I have to live with random roommates and like, you know, can't afford to do anything. So it, it's, uh, you know that's that's a problem, but it also comes from the scientists' narratives that they tell themselves and what they tell the public. If you're a research scientist and you're not producing fraudulent research, and there's a fair bit of that, you're making something that is real. You are actually making something, and it has value, and other people can build upon it. And I think that there should be this there should be a more vocal uh, discussion among scientists that they deserve, you know. 
a, a middle class lifestyle in return for what they're giving to society, what they're producing. And I think that often scientists tell each other, and I ran into this all the time, even in big pharma, oh, how dare you suggest that you know, our, our salaries aren't in line with you know, the rest of industry in this field. You're just lucky to get to do science every day. And, and that's true, but, and, and very few people get to do what they want to as their career, but it doesn't mean it should be done in an exploitative way. So I think there is a need to discuss narrative, and there's also a need to look at not funding only, but the structure of that funding. So, sorry, that was long-winded. Uh, other thoughts? Other questions? I apologize for the rambling question. Um, uh, the thing I was going to add is I completely agree with what you're saying. Uh, I think it's totally true. I don't think adding more funding would necessarily help. I guess what I say is, as someone who uh, decided not to pursue the PhD, partly because it seemed glaringly obvious what was going to happen, um, I wonder, um, as, as leaders, as people that people look to and young people think, well, these guys must be doing something because they understand the scope of the problem. Oh, I, I challenge you to uh, give people suggestions for things that they could actively do in order to change these things about. I say this because something like, for instance, the peer review system as it happens right now is very clearly broken. If, you, uh, if you're going to select for studies that create outstanding publications in nature, um, you are incentivizing people to do certain things. Um, if, as a reviewer of a study, I say, this thing is ridiculous, I am not going to let it through, there's no negative repercussion. Uh, the kinds of studies that we see which are really interesting, like the 2006 you know, induced pluripotent stem cell study, would not have happened if, like, you know, I'm sure you guys talk to people who write grants, and they all say kind of the same thing, which is, you write a grant for the thing you've already done, so you can use the money to do the thing you really want to do. These things to people who are in research are very obvious. And young people think that you guys are taking care of this, you're doing something about it. And as an older person who's in industry now and I look at it, I realize no one's doing anything about it. So again, the second, third order terms, I challenge you guys as leaders, and I know I'm like, you know, shifting the blame to you, but I challenge you to like galvanize people and really tell them, what can we do to change this? Because we shouldn't be surprised by the results that we're seeing. Sorry for the rambling. Challenge accepted. Uh, <laughs> And, and I think a lot of us are trying to do that, um, and I, I don't, I'll pass this along, but uh, this is one of the reasons that I got involved in BioCaptivate, um, because we want people to understand that maybe we could do things better for both humanity and for the scientists themselves. Um, and, uh, and in fairness, I always try to talk out to talk people out of going directly to graduate school from undergrad or directly from working for me uh, to grad school. And I always say, if I write you this letter and you get in and you're unhappy four years from now, you can't say I didn't warn you. But no, part of it's providing good advice, but part of it, I think, and I maybe haven't done this loudly enough, is to really demand and write about the change that we, we probably need uh, systemically. I totally agree with you. There is one observation I had in the system is, for example, um, Laura wanted to be a technician. I don't think today any of the students have an option of being a technician. Because how many university profs have a technician? When I was in grad school, my advisor had a technician. Five years later, the technician position eliminated. It all became soft money. and. Many of the grad students, sadly, but used as a technician. You know, many of the things could have been done by the technician who would be very happy, but do they actually have an option? Maybe we should bring some of the good things in the past and put it in place, many other positions in between. And one other thing I used to do, I used to teach a thousand student class, biology class. I was an adjunct lecturer. <laughs> So uh, my appointment, who knows whether it was going to happen again, but students would come to me because they would, uh, I used to give an um, introduction, what I did. They would all get excited about it and I would get visit. Hey, what should I do? And most of the time, I don't know uh, what I would like to do. And I said, that's quite okay. When I was an undergrad, I didn't know what I wanted to do either. But if you, uh, this is the project I work. And if you work on it, 
If you like it, you know what you like. If you don't like it, that is perfectly fine because you eliminated one thing, that this is something you don't want to do. That is just as important as what you would like to do. And well, the ones who work with me didn't go away, <laughs> so they stay with me. But it is also the environment too, how much they like. Um, one other thing I'll add to everything that's been shared up here is that uh, as important as it is to find what you love and to find a way to do it, um, sometimes that also involves getting very creative about doing things that you don't love to be able to continue to foster your you know, predilections for obscure history, in my case, like philosophy, art, whatever it is that's a kind of your side hustle thing that makes you come alive, sometimes you have to get really creative and there is no easy way where someone's going to just hand you the check in a sufficient amount for you to do the thing that you want to do in the way that you want to do it um, and you have to get kind of ruthless. Um, and so just from personal story, because I, I don't know how to tell anyone how to do that, it's very individual. Um, in, my, in my experience, I came out of college with an engineering degree uh, in the Midwest and did not want to work in engineering because it was very Dilbert-esque in that world. World. And I was working with an organization that sold proprietary fastening components to the domestic domestic automotive industry. So like patented screws, nuts, and bolts. This couldn't have been a more boring job, a more soul-crushing job. But it was a sales job, and I figured that I could probably charm my way into working a decent sales pipeline and set aside all the extra time for doing what I loved, which at the time was like being in a rock band and being a musician, and then later on studying philosophy. And so getting really comfortable with doing something I absolutely loathed very creatively was what allowed other parts of myself to not just die and become these background things I used to do, but it kept them alive. And eventually, in a weird way, on a longer arc, it landed me in a place where now I get to actually have those conversations that I've wanted to have my entire life. But man, that was a crazy, weird 10, 15 year plan that absolutely wasn't guaranteed, shouldn't have worked out. I got very lucky. So I guess my advice is be very like flexible, super creative, and get very lucky. All right. I have to. I have to just follow that with something because I talk to a lot of students all the time about how to think about internships, jobs, careers, and all of that because it's heavy on their mind. But I want to go back. I agree with one thing June said and I'm going to disagree with another which kind of builds on, on yours. One is you got to figure out what you care about. And it needs to be a problem, a situation. You may love science and you care about science, but there may be some other challenge in the world. Find something that you can get excited about. But the one thing you said is don't take a risk. And this is something that I feel like you have to in life. And I think about, I said I have a wandering path. Someday we'll have a happy hour. I'll tell you my career if anybody cares. But if I hadn't taken a chance at the craziest times, I mean, imagine seven years ago, someone came to me and said, let's go reinvent higher education. Education. Are you crazy? We're going to start a university from scratch? There are 4,000 American colleges and universities. Why in the world do we need another? But we did. And so sometimes you've got to believe and take a leap. And especially if you're younger in your career, you got more flexibility before you have obligations, take chances because chances will open up opportunities. So I, wanna, I would like to add one more thing. You don't have to be just young to take the risk. You can be older too. <laughs> just listen to your heart. If it is a job that you really didn't like it, it will really crush your soul slowly, slowly, slowly. And listen to yourself and am I really happy? Can I actually do something else? Or just feel it once in a while, evaluate how much you like it because I do it even though I like what I do even every couple of months I think about it do I still like it do I still move forward or how can I make it because if you don't like it when the tough times comes in it's gonna be really hard but if you're really passionate about it and if you like it tough times will come and you'll think about a way so how can I make it happen okay I have this 10 months or five months, can I make it? Or what can I do six months later that's gonna get better? And you'll get to see the opportunities. Keep your eyes on the opportunities. Things doesn't come at the time you anticipate. It comes in, but you have multiple options. When you see it, grab it when it shows up. I just wanna add, I actually miss 
I explained what I was mentioning about risk. I think oftentimes when you are faced with a risk, if you actually think about all the underlying factors, it's not a risk at all. Every, I've um, essentially switched four jobs in f six years, and each time there was like, am I leaving this entire field of study that I did my PhD in? And I was like, you know, that's actually not a big of a risk. Let's try it. So did that and then, you know, started a company that was a huge risk and then and then ended up here at IndieBio. So, so yes, absolutely take the risk. Um, but I think from the mindset side, if you are scared about something and you're scared and you have all this fear, if you actually break it down, there's really nothing to fear. So I wanted to um, uh, be cognizant of the time and give everyone time to mingle with our panelists. And I know other people might have questions. Please pose them individually, uh, and um, because we, we want to give time for people to mingle. And uh, our organizer, Yen, uh, is going to come up and just briefly explain uh, how he wants us to make small talk uh, and mingle, but not, not the normal small talk, not a small talk without a subject. He wants us to actually focus on, on meaningful uh, small talk or, or, or subject directed. So Yen, uh, did you want to explain that? Come up here. Well, um, a little personal story first. I, um, so it was in 2016 that I was uh, volunteering for an organization and I invite uh, Robin to speak. And at the time that I was uh, broke, unemployed, and virtually homeless, I mean couch surfing. And also I, I graduated from SFSU with an uh, undergrad degree. So that's basically considered unimportant in the eyes of a lot of people in science. But the thing is, at the time that I believed that it's my dream, it's something I'm willing to die for, is to change the culture of science. And even for me, that like someone who was so insignificant that can bring people together and have some kind of impact. So I think is anyone can have impact. So it's like it doesn't matter how small or insignificant you are. If your desire, your belief is strong enough, enough then um, your impact will come out. And also, like, if, if Yen can cook some magic, you can cook some magic. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, uh, the following section will be the um, networking section. So actually, I would say no, no small talk. Talk about big things. What's your drive? What's your deepest desire? What's your deepest longing? Like, what make you feel alive? And also, like, um, all gatherings are social contracts. So the thing is, like, what is Biocaptive Way? We create those gatherings that are um, trying to transform, trying to help people to uh, embrace a deeper part of themselves, and trying to achieve something that they, they didn't think is possible. There are a lot of amazing people here, and so therefore that I, I think that you should talk about not just your deepest longing, but also like what, what's lacking, like, like what do you need, what type of talent or help or opportunity that you want or you need that like more than likely that you will meet someone even just tonight that can bridge that gap and bring you to your next chapter and I know that from my own personal experience that there's only one thing in life that truly matters is how to go to the next chapter how to change the rules the ground rules and the ground rules are everything and so and also I have some print out is those I call them uh, my muse so it's just some um, some of my favorite quote so you're welcome to take a peek and 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 um, pick something that speak to your heart and discuss with the uh, uh, whoever that, uh, that, that you've, you click. And so this is uh, a very good way to do networking, but also like you don't have to use them, you can just take them home and I, I think they're wonderful quotes and very trans transforma transformational, or transformative. And, and then the other thing is I will encourage you, you to talk about how we can transform the inter-organizational and intra-organizational relations because this world is made of relations and also like how to transform your own relation with yourself like I, I earlier I posed a question about what's your narrative and then what are your narratives we all have many narratives and some are mutually incompatible and some uh, fortify each other so and it is our own job and also our duty towards others to kind of augment the narrative to help people to pick out the good narratives and and, uh, and get rid of the the not so helpful ones so that's about it thank you everyone
All right, thank you. All right, let's have some wine and, and uh, no small talk. <laughs>